the attendees are filing in. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have um, folks filing in from the waiting room now that we've gone live and are happy to have you here. Welcome. We'll get started. We hope in just a couple of minutes, we're going to let um, folks come in and wanted to, um, those of you who are already logging in, let you uh, check your sound and get situated. Thank you for being here this evening. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being here. I see some ASLI colleagues, um, some Wofford students and Wofford alums, as well as folks from elsewhere, and thrilled to have you um, join us. Thank you all for being here. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, Dr. Ivara is rejoining after having um, some weather interruptions in Texas. Hear me? Can hear you. It's a little choppy. Um, glad glad you were able to make it back on. We're gonna give folks just a minute or two um, to join in. And again, welcome to those of you just, um, just signing in. Glad to have you here. I'm gonna keep talking so you can check your sounds. Um, and we're gonna hope that um, Priscilla Ibarra is able to connect with a good connection soon. Um, she's in Texas. And if you've seen the um, weather forecast, it's a a little bit of a high drama night there. So um, we're gonna play it by ear and hope she's able to uh, stay safe and sound first of all, and also to be with us uh, to share what looks like a really exciting talk. Thank you all for your patience. And um, I'm gonna see if Dr. Prasila Ivara can um, hear us and is able to connect. And if so, we'll get started in just a second. I'm here. Can you see me, hear me? <laughs> I can see and hear you. Thank you. Do you feel like it's a go? Right. Are you safe and secure? I, I'm safe. I'm not sure how stable the internet is. Okay, we will we will play it right here. Thank you so much, um, and it's a relief to see you see you back um, after the momentary flicker there. And we'll hope it stays momentary. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. Um, we are recording so that you can have access to the live transcript for closed captioning. You can find that option on the control bar that usually appears at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you're on a, um, on a device computer um, or tablet. 
Um, we are so thrilled to welcome you to this talk in the series of Engaged Scholarship for the 21st Century, hosted by Wofford College. I'm Laura Barbas Roden, many of you know me, Professor of Modern Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. And for those of you joining a Wofford event for the first time, um, an extra hearty welcome. We're thrilled that our virtual events are able to welcome folks from the region and from all over the world. So thank you for being with us. By way of logistical information, um, we want to let you know that we'll have time for a couple of questions later. We'll ask that you use the Q&A box again on your control panel to put your question forward, and you can do that at any time. By way of opening, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining you from lands important to the Cherokee and the Catawba peoples in territory that was cared for them and others before them for generations and ceded by the Cherokee to the South Carolina colony in 1755. Second, my institution of employment was built in parts by the labor of people who were enslaved and with the wealth of enslavers. And finally, I want to thank you all for being here and I want to thank Cultural Affairs and the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion for supporting this talk. And now it's my great good fortune and feeling extra lucky um, given the interruptions we, we have had to introduce Dr. Priscilla Ibarra, Associate Professor in the Department of English at the University of North Texas, where she teaches Chicanx literature and environmental humanities. Her book, Writing the Good Life, Mexican-American Literature and the Environment, published by University of Arizona Press in 2016, was chosen for the 2017 Thomas J. Lyon Award in Western American Literary and Cultural Studies. Ibarra is also co-editor of Latinx and Environmentalism's Place Justice in the Decolonial, published by Temple University Press, um, a collection of innovative, really wonderful scholarly essays and groundbreaking interviews with writers. Um, she co-edited that book with Sarah D. Wald, David Vasquez, and Sarah Chiquette Ray, and it was awarded the 2022 MLA <clears throat> Prize for an Edited Collection. Her current book project concerns her search for an eco-genealogy as a Chicana. She is active in numerous projects in the public humanities, and perhaps of special interest to our gathering tonight is her annotated list of recommended books by Mexican-American writers on environmental issues, which appears in the Orion blog. Um, without further ado, um, I'll turn things over to Dr. Ibarra, um, and I'm just really thrilled that you all have a chance to hear from her tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. It's really a great pleasure to uh, join you here. And I'd like to thank Laura and Wofford College for the invitation to share my work with your community um, and to everyone you know, behind the scenes um, that to make this event possible. I know it takes a lot of uh, collaboration to um, like this happen at, at any university. So thank you very much. I'm speaking to you from uh, the North Texas region where I live and where I'm from. And uh, these are the lands of the Wichita and Caddo affiliated tribes. Uh, and and um, it was in was of the organizations who against uh, indigenous peoples. Um, town was also founded during uh, the time of transition from this area from Mexico to um, becoming part of the United States. And when the tech became an institution that uh, persecuted uh, indigenous peoples, as well as um, my people, Mexican Americans. Um, so uh, part of uh, what I'm talking to you about this evening um, is linked to all of those histories of colonization and uh, violence, um, as well as looking to genealogies of abundance within our own um, uh, heritages. Uh, however, we might want to define that. So um, let me just uh, get going. I'm going to share um, a couple of images as I go along here. Okay, so um, I'm here to share with you a bit of my journey searching for my environmental foremothers. Uh, overall, I'm calling this project a Chicana eco-genealogy. 
And I'm writing toward an eco genealogy to, to document the ecological contributions that Mexican American women specifically have been making for at least 150 years. This goes beyond the literary historical documentation to which I have already been contributing. And I want to explain how three frameworks guide this work genealogy, place, and women. I look to genealogy specifically because so much of what I feel like I have done as a scholar and a teacher is to fill in the violent erasure of Mexican American and Chicanx presence over the years. I've gone through the process of filling these gaps for myself as a student, learning history, literature, and arts. I never got the opportunity to explore until I went to graduate school. And then I now turn around and help my students to fill these gaps too. We're learning our past and the who and the where to which we are related. Thus, I'm drawn to the language of genealogy for its warmth of kinship relations, be that blood relatives or chosen families. The language of gene genealogy also allows space for the tracing of origins in relation to places as well as movements and migrations. Genealogy the fur of trees, limbs, and branches. And I want to plant a tree of Chicana eco genealogy, and I want to find the stem where my leaf sprouts. I'm also building this project from a very specific sense of place. I'm inspired by the way that Laurette Savoy discusses the way that our lives take place in her 2015 book, Trace, Memory, History, Race, and the American Landscape. Quote, our lives take place in movements large and small of the Anishinaabe becoming a people indigenous to the particularities of the Great Lakes region, woodlands, and lakes of newcomer of newcomers searching for minerals the sifting of shoreline stones with each wave swash of choices and practices aimed at possessing and controlling both territory and ideas of it savoy's so sense of place is active taking place and the human acts alongside the more than human movements, large and small, sifting shoreline stones. Humans and water alike inhabit and shape the shorelines, but not with the same force or sense of reciprocity. And too often we see it is the human that fails to uphold an ethical practice of reciprocity. But it is not just the human in general, but the human caught up in systems that rationalize exploitation, uh, colonization, capitalism, patriarchy, racism. Interestingly, Carla Carnejo, uh, Cornejo Villavicencio chooses a quote from Joan Didion's on the, uh, on the topic of place as epigraph from her, for her powerful book of creative nonfiction, The Undocumented Americans, published in 2020. Cornejo Villavicencio, quotes Didion from the White Album, quote, a place belongs forever to whoever claims it hardest, remembers it most obsessively, wrenches it from itself, shapes it, renders it, loves it so radically that he remakes it in his own image, end quote. Cornejo Villavicencio proceeds to show how undocumented people in the United States build lives of fierce beauty and belonging no matter what the law says. This sense of place too is active, in process, ongoing. One cannot build a genealogy without attention to origins and movements. And it is with Savoy's sense of taking place that I build this genealogy. Finally, I build this genealogy centered on the lives of women. My journey to encounter the more than human world in Mexican American imaginaries has always been guided by Chicana feminists. And I choose to honor legacy 
that legacy by building a genealogy with women at its core. As I expand this work, I will also be writing about my mother, without whom I would not have originally cultivated my sense of wonder and reverence for this land. So for the next portion of this talk, I'm going to um, give you just a brief overview of two of the women that I'm talking about. And then um, for the kind of second half of the talk, I'm going to share with you just some of my own personal writing. Um, and just to let you know, I'm not sure if uh, Laura mentioned this, but there's a big storm. <laughs> there's a big storm passing through. So you might've heard my dog uh, barking at the sirens and the lightning going off. So. Um, I'm hoping that our connection remains secured here. So let me transition to um, these two women. Uh, today I bring together work by a poet alongside the writings of a botanist, two women born 150 years ago in the 1870s. One lived in the second half of the 20th century and the other only into the early part of the 20th century. Both women made enormous contributions, especially given the limits that patriarchy and racial discrimination placed on Mexican women at that time. So first I wanna uh, share with you um, some information about Francisca Carrillo Vallejo Magueregan. I'm gonna be speaking specifically about uh, poems from her collection along the high Highway of the King was published in 1943 uh, by Oakland's Howell North Press. Um, she also was the host for uh, over 100 episodes of a radio program in San Francisco, California. And the title of the radio program was Padres, Gringos, and Gold. And, um, and that started in 1936. Uh, she was the granddaughter of Mariano Vallejo, and for those of you familiar with um, Maria Amparo Ruiz de Burton's novel, The Squatter and the Dawn, her grandfather was the uh, model for the character of Don Mariano Alamar in that novel. Um, and uh, he was a, a very important figure in the development of um, the history of California, of um, Mexican-American California. And uh, in other work, I write about Mariano Vallejo's role in establishing the uh, commercial wine industry in California. He was the first person to grow um, uh, wine grapes for commercial uh, production of wine, but he's not credited as being the father of uh, California winemaking. That title often goes to uh, a Hungarian immigrant by the name of Augustin Haristi, who learned winemaking from Mariano Vallejo. So a very um, storied family in California, a uh, very interesting um, history that they uh, they have in California. And, you know, um, I, I part of uh, bringing um, Vallejo Magueregan into this project is, um, having a chance to reflect on um, what it might have been like if I had known about Mariano Vallejo, if I had known about Francisca Vallejo Magueregan, uh, when I was first developing my identity as a Chicana who cared about the more than human world when I was an undergraduate student. Um, so that's part of the, the writing that's also uh, braided into this um, uh, eco-genealogy narrative. Uh, but I just want to give you a taste of some of Francisca's poetry. Um, here's a poem titled Palo Alto, and uh, she speaks to, you know, her feeling of humility in the face of natural beauty, a poem about a giant sequoia tree. Palo Alto, sequoia spire whose hoary arms in lonely plea extend. What cycle knew your infancy, your prime? Who shall attend when secrets of the misty past are wrested from your breast, when God desiring beckons you and falling, you find rest? Um, that is uh, kind of a typical of the voice that she has in many of the poems and um, several poems uh, with that theme consistent of kind of awe in um, the face of natural beauty. 
Um, but she also has, has this other poem that's in a kind of different voice that uh, in which she notes the rush of capitalism and consumerism of the, the rush of the city. Um, and this, this poem is titled The City and a few sample lines, uh, clang, clang, rush, rush. The sons of man are mammon mad, poor plodding slaves who toil and sweat for glittering gold and so forget the brightness of the sun. And then another line further down where she echoes that um, clang, clang, hush, hush. The toilers sleep, but while they rest, the chimneys belch, the forges blaze, and turn the nights to molten days that fade before the dawn. And then uh, finally, I wanna share with you a poem uh, about Yosemite. Um, well, a line from her poem about Yosemite and she um, calls it a jewel hid in California's heart. Uh, and of course, um, in the history of American environmentalism, Yosemite stands as one of the landmark uh, parks that inspired the movement to establish uh, national parks. And uh, she's writing about um, Yosemite kind of in the shadow of, of that, um, those kinds of movements. Um, and again, you know, I didn't know that, that there were um, Mexican Americans that were um, participating in um, that area in uh, the process of um, protecting places like that. Um, uh, even though I also want to be careful to um, recognize, you know, however problematically um, that is, which I get into um, critiques of uh, that wilderness idea in um, other aspects of my work. But nonetheless, it's very interesting to know that um, Vallejo McGettigan was there. And then the next figure that I want to share with you was actually um, a member of the Sierra Club and um, a member of the Save the Wet Redwoods League. So this is my transition over to um, Ines Mejia. <clears throat> so uh, there's a picture of, of Ines. Um, she also shared a passion for the trees, uh, similar to um, Francisca Vallejo. Uh, she was not from California, uh, but she ended up there eventually. Uh, she was born in Washington, D.C. Her father was a, um, a diplomat uh, from Mexico. And her family had leagues of land in Texas that were granted to their family uh, when uh, Ines's grandfather was uh, killed by Santa Ana. Um, but they, their family was uh, recognized for contributions to the government nonetheless and, and were given uh, leagues of land in Texas, um, which her uh, father inherited from uh, after her grandfather's death. Um, and there's a town named Mejia, Texas, just uh, kind of southwest of, uh, southeast of Dallas. Um, she was born in 1870 and was sent to boarding schools for her education. And once she completed her education, uh, her father uh, who had divorced her mother, her mother was uh, Anglo-American um, and her father had moved back to Mexico to the family Hacienda in Mexico. And once she finished her boarding school um, education, he summoned her back to the Hacienda and um, asked for her help in managing the Hacienda. He was um, a, divorced, not yet remarried at the time. So she helped to manage the, the Hacienda. He eventually remarried and uh, she did not have a very good relationship with her, with her stepmother. Um, and then um, she did marry and her um, first marriage didn't work out. And her second marriage, um, her husband plunged her into uh, debt and then she, she was widowed. And that uh, really impacted her emotionally and she fell into a depression. And that's the way she, that she ends up in San Francisco. She goes to San Francisco to, to seek medical help and she participates in kind of, you know, an early period of um, psychiatry. And one of the things that her doctor suggests to her is outdoor recreation to, um, to go for walks, to um, spend time in the forests. And that's how she ends up with the Save the Redwoods League and with the Sierra Club. 
And she learns that, you know, she's always had this kind of abiding passion for um, uh, botany. And she ends up going back to, to school and gets a degree uh, as a botanist um, at the age of 55. And I'm about to turn 50 and I have some inklings that I want to become an ornithologist. So uh, <laughs> that's uh, inspiring for me. I'm not sure that I actually do it, but um, it's certainly inspiring to know that that she actually um, did it. But that was not the end of the story. It was just kind of like the beginning of her of her story, getting that uh, degree. Uh, she became a botanist at the age of 55, and she traveled to Latin America collecting botanical specimens even spending two years in the Brazilian Amazon at the age of 59. And she collected more than 145,000 specimens in her lifetime. And then uh, tragically, she died of cancer in 1938, I think, you know, ahead um, too soon. Um, so um, in learning about uh, Ines Mejia, uh, and in my research, trying to find out more about uh, what she was like or, um, you know, stories about her. I came across an oral history that was taken in 1965, and uh, it was uh, recording the memories of one of Ines Mejia's collaborators, N. Floyd Bracelin. Uh, and uh, Bracelin would process Mejia's specimens. So once she got back from all of these trips, uh, Bracelin was there to, to help label and catalog um, her specimens, which is a really important part of the process, right? And she she men mentions in this oral history that uh, Mejia is really not that interested in, in that aspect of the process, that she's more interested in being out in the field and uh, collecting the specimens. And then once she got back, um, she relied on others to help her process um, the specimens, which of course, you know, it's a collaborative kind of model in, in science. Um, the other thing that I uh, kind of learned about uh, Mejia um, kind of context that she was negotiating um, is sort of an unpleasant story from one of these um, recordings, uh, oral histories. I, I don't have the recording. I just have access to the, the written transcript. Um, but in that written transcript, um, Bracelin says repeatedly that Mejia had a difficult personality. She was uh, apparently kind of spiky. And uh, her biographer, Derlin uh, Anima, also mentions that um, uh, Mejia was reportedly kind of uh, a difficult personality. Um, Bracelin really repeats this quite a bit in this oral history. Um, and then I, I wondered about that when I, I read I wondered about um, the, the depiction of Mejia as a spiky character after I read this other description. Um, it's quite telling. So I'm gonna share a little bit um, from that transcript with you. Um, basically the interviewer is asking questions about uh, Ines Mejia and uh, Bracelin is saying that Mejia would collect some kind of strange uh, souvenirs, things that she labeled um, silly things. Silly things appealed to her uh, taste. And um, in order to explain what she meant by silly things um, and why they would appeal to Mejia, she says, yes, they would. After all, uh, she was a peon. Mrs. Mejia really was a peon. Um, and then she goes into this description of um, uh, an unpleasant episode in which um, a colleague was um, teasing Ines Mejia and uh, Mejia happened to have a knife on her and they were out sitting outside on the Berkeley campus um, uh, having a picnic. And apparently Mejia had a knife on her and she pulled it out and teasingly poked the the young woman uh, in the leg who had been uh, teasing her and uh, apparently drew blood. Um, and Bracelin says, um, well, the, the interviewer says, but she didn't really mean to puncture her probably. 
And then Bracelin says, you see, that was the Mexican in her. At times she'd be violent, maybe for a few seconds. And that was the background in her. So, you know, that makes me kind of wonder about these descriptions of Mejia as a difficult character or a spiky character, which, you know, I recognize is within the realm of, of possibility and we all have our uh, moments of impatience. Um, but there's uh, lenses of interpretation uh, that I'm just not quite sure how to navigate that um, at this point in my research, but I thought I would share with you that moment from that oral history, just to give you a sense of um, the world that these women were navigating at the time that they were doing this work, you know, uh, Vallejo with her radio program and uh, writing and publishing her poetry and Mejia um, getting her degree in botany and uh, collaborating with other scientists. Um, I, I uh, get the sense that they, she was navigating a pretty um, prejudicial, uh, discriminatory um, context. So um, this, this is where I'll pick up my, my text again. This gives us some idea of the context these two women encountered in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Both these women were negotiating their sense of self through the position of what Jose Aranda calls, quote, settler hybrids, end quote, in his book, the Places of Modernity and Early Mexican American Literature, 1848 to 1948. That was just published in 2022. Uh, families like the Vallejos and Mejias processed identity in relation to twice colonized places. That's a quote. Aranda astutely observes that the settler identities of these families, quote, did not simply disappear, end quote, with the coming of a new U.S. racial order, but that their former, quote, former identities, because of their connection to settler power, would come to shadow this community's uneven accommodation and resistance to coloniality, especially with regard to settler land claims, end quote. This all amounts to the, quote, settler hybrid identities, end quote, having a, quote, contradictory relation to place, end quote. And for this reason, an extended exploration of Mexican-American relation to place and places must continue. And in at least a minimal regard, relation to place entails practices of and for the land, knowledge and practices that extend a culture that can continue to inhabit a given place over time. So that um, sums up my kind of uh, sharing with you um, a couple of the profiles of the women that I'm working with. So with the time that I have left, I'd like to share with you um, a sample of the personal narrative that I'm including uh, or you know, hope to include um, in this project as I develop it. But this is where um, one of these personal narratives kind of stands right now. Um, and uh, this is an example of interweaving my own story into the stories of these powerful women. Um, and specifically, I'm paying attention to my own sense of place and my own process of becoming and belonging in relationship to place. So I'm going to um, share with you a, a different um, set of images here. Okay. I am a queer Chicana US-based academic with the rare, rare privilege of spending most of my life in one place. I live on the unceded lands of the Wichita and Caddo affiliated tribes in, er in an area known for now as North Texas. I observe vibrant spring and fall migrations of birds and butterflies. I watch the post oaks go through their cycles of bright to deep green foliage, brown and then bare limbs. I float my kayak on the various tributaries to the Trinity River. I watch cactus fruit ripen into delicious magenta and I listen to the excited yips of coyotes at night. And I might add, I listen to dramatic uh, thunderstorms uh, as we speak. 
about three years ago, I started paying more attention to my backyard birds. They themselves insisted I take notice. I saw the owl on July 24th. I know because I took a photo of him, but I didn't bother to look up his name or other characteristics, song, habitat, frequency in my area. But that sighting tripped something in me. I started wondering about the other birds I regularly saw in my yard, and I learned their names. Carolina chickadee, tufted titmouse, in addition to the few I knew already from childhood, cardinal, mockingbird, blue jay, robin, vulture, crow. The owl I learned was a barred owl, a juvenile. You can tell by the fuzzy feathers. My knowledge started expanding. Who is that little brown bird with the longish curved beak and the loud twitter? Carolina Wren. And hey, there's a woodpecker, except for wait, there's another one that looks completely different. Red-bellied woodpecker and downy woodpecker. So when a pair of black-throated green warblers, small olive yellow, black and white birds with the male sporting deep black feathers on his throat, showed up in my backyard in the fall, I had a little more of a clue about how special that was. Their return the following spring thrilled me. I was hooked. By March 2020, I found solace from the pandemic quarantine isolation by posting almost daily photos of my backyard birds as the hashtag Chicana birder. I dedicate my writing and teaching to the documentation of the links between my Mexican American culture, the land and social justice. As such, one might think that my longevity of place would be reflected in my knowledge of, of its natural history, the local flora, fauna and geology. But this awareness took hold only when I started bird watching. And even then I did not identify myself as someone who had the capacity to become an actual birder or a natural historian. I simply found in birding a comfort, a way to escape the constantly ticking clock, the urgency of linear time. I learned to dwell in place and with the cycles of seasonal being to pay attention to the world in the ways my Mexican mother has been patiently suggesting throughout my life. Her childhood on a farm in the northern Mexican state of Tamaulipas instilled in her a deep ongoing sense of place and seasonality. In line with my previous writing, where I argue that Mexican Americans do not identify with conventional environmentalism, nor does conventional environmentalism hold a place for Mexican American contributions, how can I understand my new practice of paying attention to birds? In other words, what lessons emerge from contextualizing within the broader structures of colonization and capitalism the Mexican American knowledge and practices that can be too narrowly defined as environmental. I propose to affirm abundance in ways that resonate with the values of abolition feminism and in critical coalition with indigenous land restoration as accountability for colonial violence. The way that birding helps me escape from linear time can connect me to indigenous practices if I let it. As Potawatomi philosopher Kyle White advises, linearity is only one way of experiencing time. He shares that indigenous time centers on spirals, cycles, seasons, and relationships. A clan can draw its identity from the role they play during a seasonal event, say the time of wild rice cultivation, rather than from the accumulation of material goods or the longevity of power. This is a system of governance known as the seasonal round system. Another way that spiral time can impact lived experience has to do with the maintenance of kinship ties among humans, as well as between humans and other beings. Community members measure quality of relations by the maintenance of just reciprocities and mutual respect. My practice of daily birding gives me an opportunity to briefly inhabit spiral time, where I experience my friendship with the migrating birds, appreciate their appearance according to their own terms and needs, and do what I can to support their movements, such as setting out sugar water for the ruby-throated uh, hummingbirds 
and the black chinned hummingbirds in the spring and summer. But what happens if I let myself follow the path of White's argument about spiral time and consider the larger implications? White explains, move this. Uh, White explains that when it comes to climate crisis, indigenous peoples inhabit a different temporality than the West. The indigenous dystopia has already been taking place for over 500 years, and the present conditions are the fantasy future of a settler colonial past. White observes, quote, settler ancestors gifted their descendants the capacity to be able to believe to their very core that indigenous self-determination is illegal, end quote. Now the West's fantasy is coming to an end. This is not because settler coloniality is finally acknowledging indigenous self-determination, but because climate change is beginning to make fossil fuel-based and other extractive economies untenable, a phenomenon becoming known as the Anthropocene. <clears throat> Oops. Find my place here again. For colonized cultures, this crisis is nothing new. We have long suffered the consequences of the loss of our relations, human and beyond. Canadian scholar Audra Mitchell argues that the present day focus on species extinctions distracts from the ways that indigenous peoples' relations with other beings and lands have been deeply disrupted by colonization's violent displacements. She explains that colonization has already enacted a centuries long mass extinction event by displacing native nations from ancestral lands. Birding and other natural history practices tell us that species are starting to go extinct at alarming rates, but that relates only to a Western timeline. The light of the relations that kept those species alive dimmed a long time ago. Comparing Western linear time versus indigenous spiral time cautions me that natural history tells a story too narrowly defined by the power dynamics of colonization and capitalism. I want to distance my observation of species, seasonal shifts, and local geology from a practice of science that accords to a Western imaginary and reinforces the same enlightenment era logics behind colonization and capitalism. I want to see how my experiences with the birds and the wind and the rain and the lizards and the frogs and the rivers do something else. I work toward rituals that reinstate ethical practices of respecting all of my relations in a way that is consistent with my indigenous kin. The practice I seek to establish resonates with what Potawatomi scientist and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer calls upon us all to recognize when she explains how in her people's language of Potawatomi, there is no it for nature. Living beings are referred to as subjects, never as objects, and personhood is extended to all who breathe and some who don't. I greet the silent boulder people with the same respect as I do the talkative chickadees, end quote. So what do we learn once we decide to turn toward the lessons that cultures who have defied colonization offer from inhabiting a changed world for over 500 years. Well, first we have to take an honest look at the trauma bound up in that history. I think I've uh, spoken to that some um, already this evening. Um, and I'm trying to look to where I can maybe skip ahead a little bit to make sure that we have some time for uh, Q and A. Um, and I just uh, have a photograph of my family um, who experience um, as migrant farm workers, uh, a lot of the violence that I'm uh, describing here uh, historically, right? Um, and this uh, is, um, you know, we, we can dwell in this uh, space of um, what we've been deprived of, but I'm also really hoping that we can move towards uh, the imaginary of um, affirming abundance. That's really what um, 
what I'm moving towards in this book by uh, offering a genealogy that um, tells a broader story, right? Um, and that resonates with uh, Gerald Bisner's sense of, um, of survivance. Uh, that's an uh, affirmation of abundance of uh, survival and, and thriving. Um, and this is not just to, um, to get by or to uh, um, a kind of a, a small idea. These are really big ideas, you know, and these are the challenges that we're facing, um, not just to kind of shift our, our thinking or approaches a little bit, but really we're talking about remaking the world. Um, so I think I want to stop there and um, open it up to conversation, um, questions, discussion, um, because I know we got started a little bit later, so I just want to be aware of the time. Thank you. And I'll stop thank my share. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, and I will ask the attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to put them um, in the chat and we will um, make sure that we have a chance to, to ask those. I'm going to switch us to gallery view. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's um, really remarkable to think about that genealogy and those two very full lives um, of the of the uh, women with whom you started. I'm thinking about just the abundance um, of Mejia's work and the, the number of samples that she collected just sort of speaks to a level of energy and enthusiasm and passion that's that's really remarkable. Um, and so maybe I'll ask a question about your affirming abundance in your writing practice. What does that what does that look like and feel like for you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really good question. I think that I have uh, shifted my framework um, the first part of my career, I was really uh, pitching things to um, a broader kind of audience, or maybe, um, uh, you know, not, I was trying to speak to both um, my Mexican American um, culture and, and family and kin, but also a broader kind of white environmentalist um, conversation. And I've I, I'm no longer um, trying to appeal to um, that broader audience or maybe, you know, um, uh, combat um, preconceived notions about what our culture has to offer. I'm just kind of, you know, letting that conversation go and really focusing on um, who we are and where we've been and what gaps we need to fill um, for ourselves and speaking to one another. And if someone else wants to listen in on that conversation, that's great, you know. Um, but that's the sense in which I really turn to um, abundance and creating abundance and inhabiting our own um, uh, contexts and how rich those are, right? Because we're not, I mean, if you're trying to appeal to a broad mainstream, then you might tend to oversimplify uh, who we are, but you see how um, these two figures are, are pretty different. Uh, Francisca Vallejo and Ines Mejia are, are very different kinds of uh, lives. And even though they were both from sort of um, uh, upper middle class um, or even uh, wealthy in terms of landed class uh, backgrounds, uh, they still live pretty uh, different lives. And uh, by the time you get to like, you know, my generation, I'm the granddaughter of um, the, the two, you know, the couple that you see in that, uh, in that photograph. And um, uh, that, that's a very, those are all very different lives, but we're all part of even, not even like a Latinx, um, reality, but just like a Mexican American reality in this country. So we we represent, you know, multitudes, <laughs> much diversity. So that's one sense of abundance that I'm uh, embracing in my work these days. Yeah, that's amazing and fantastic. And I um, appreciate that framing of sort of the um, the texture and the heterogeneity of those stories. And um, and it must sort of unfold as you as you do that, I guess, listening or the hearing the voices that you, that are captured in the transcripts um, and thinking about um, 
the worlds they moved in and, and shaped and held. Um, we do have a question, um, and it's a, it's a big one, um, about an uh, explanation of why Western environmentalism is problematic. And I'm thinking particularly of the, um, uh, the uh, comment um, that you made about um, Western environmentalism really not having a place um, for the perspectives um, that might have been brought and that were being brought by um, botanists and scholars um, and, and continues to this day. So maybe if you could speak briefly to that question. Yeah, that um, that is built on uh, other work that I've done. My first book is really um, uh, an, an attempt to, in, well, initially when I was first drafting that, an attempt to fit Mexican-American environmental narratives into the existing environmental framework. And um, that book took me a really long time to write, partly because that was not ever going to fit that the uh, Western environmental narrative um, was really um, missing the critique of colonization. And if I was going to be able to be true to the story of Mexican American um, environmental or you know, writing about the natural world, then I had to account for the um, experience of colonization. I mean, within the um, narratives of say mid 20th century Mexican American and um, Chicano and Chicano writings, um, the, the fact of land possession and dispossession after the US-Mexico war just looms large. And um, if we don't have uh, an accounting for the history of colonization within environmentalism, um, then we just can't make sense of, of work like that. Um, and the, the big gap that I saw was that, you know, uh, environmentalism, environmental philosophy, environmental thought was really grappling with the, um, the split between nature and culture, between, you know, mind and body, was acknowledging and um, facing up to that challenge. Um, but that, uh, that split was built on the history of colonization. And there's no way that environmentalism can reckon with that um, human and um, nature uh, split or you know, culture and nature split without recognizing that it's built on a history of colonization and capitalism. Um, so, I, I'm happy for environmentalism to um, be engaged in its own kind of conversation and its own reckoning. I offer this analysis um, for, for that um, path. Um, and the path that I'm pursuing is a decolonial path, which is we're having a conversation that in which we do account for those histories. Um, and we don't call it environmentalism. Uh, I, in my first book, I call it good life writing. Um, maybe, you know, this uh, eco genealogy is a different kind of term that I'm, I'm trying to uh, coin here. So and there's just like different language that we use in order to talk about this. I, I hope that that is a big question. So I hope that that helps to address that some. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for offering the question. Looks like we have another one. Let me um, scroll there. Uh, it was a thank you, enthusiastic thank you um, from uh, from our um, uh, participant. Thank you for a super interesting talk um, and best wishes from an environmental humanities student in Sweden in Europe. So um, thank you um, oh, nice. for, for being here. Um, <laughs> Let me ask just one sort of parting question. Um, I know that you've been involved in a lot of public humanities work in the arts. Um, and I wonder um, sort of what what sort of, um, uh, it, it seems like it would be a very generative space and a very um, relational space. And I wonder if you could talk about some of the public humanities projects that you've been, that you've been part of um, and how that speaks to reciprocity and relationality. Yeah, great. Thank you for that um, that question. Um, last spring, I was uh, involved with the local um, theater, Caramia Theater, and their um, playwright in residence, Virginia Grice, who just does like 
amazing work on top of amazing work on top of amazing work. So just like uh, look her up if, if you're not familiar with her work yet, you know, those in the audience. Um, and uh, what we did, and it, she called this uh, a performance lab and she invited me to uh, join in the journey as a project dramaturg, which just meant that I got to talk to her about what the process was like in these really cool conversations. I was like, what's a dramaturg? And she told me we get to talk about things. So, um, but I also just like participated in the whole process. I was basically like part of her cohort because um, I said, I have to be part of the process in order to observe it. Right? So what it was, was a performance lab and it was still during, you know, some uh, pandemic isolation. So we ended up doing it online and we met um, I think maybe six different times uh, with a cohort of community members from Pleasant Grove, which is a neighborhood in South Dallas. And it's one of the two zip codes that are the most incarcerated in Texas. And the other zip code is Oak Cliff, which is actually where uh, I was born and where uh, my family members live. Um, so uh, that was kind of the, the premise of the project is to gather people from um, this very um, uh, policed, highly policed um, area. And that's very much impacted by uh, practices of incarceration um, in this country. And that was really it, you know, she invited artists to speak to the cohort. And our goal was to come up with some kind of a performance by the end of the process, which we did. And, and what we did is we took over an empty lot in Pleasant Grove uh, for a day and we installed what we called a freedom garden and we had stations um, of different experiences so you could have like do yoga in one place and you could create a collage and another stop and another stop was just like this really beautiful space that was created underneath the shade of a tree and we had picnic tables that we put together that morning um, and I uh, designed a station that was, you know, surprise, surprise, meant to gather oral histories because that's my obsession. Um, so that was just really beautiful to get to sit and talk. It was a beautiful spring day. Um, we invited Sharon Day uh, from Minnesota, who is an Ojibwe leader and um, co-founder of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force in um, Minneapolis. And she also leads water walks and she gave us the um, opening welcome for the Freedom Garden Day. And then we had a water ceremony at the Trinity River the next morning that she led. So it was just, just beautiful and one of the best experiences of my life. And we're hoping to um, reproduce that kind of methodology in other places. Um, in order to create community. And uh, Vicki Grice's sense of art is really that everyone is an artist, that everyone, um, that considering yourself not an artist is a colonized mentality, um, that that's one of the things that's kind of stolen from us uh, through the process of colonization is our sense of creativity. Um, so uh, the, the foundation of her art is to bring community together and to create art together. So I really admire that work. And I'm so pleased to experience just a small part of it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds like um, an amazing practice of liberation and also reclamation of space by being in that lot um, and co-creating um, for a day together um, in what sounds like um, a place of abundance um, that was made a place of abundance by that participation. Thank you. That's um, a remarkable way to end and um, I hope um, an inspiring note on which to conclude um, this, this Thursday evening. Um, thank you to everyone who came. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, stay tuned on uh, so social media uh, for upcoming talks. Um, we have one last one that'll be in person um, and then hope to have some more virtual ones next year. So um, thank you so very much for being here and look forward to, to seeing many of you the next time. Um, lots thank of thanks so much. here. Yeah, in the chat. And again, thank you all. Um, we'll let you um, get on to your evening and um, keep Dr. Ivara here for just a minute more as you all, all exit. Thank you again for coming. I see folks who have 
who have joined us from from the Carolinas and from from way far beyond. So um, so delightful to have folks here. I think everyone has exited. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hate to just end at the end because it feels so abrupt after usually, you know, like a wonderful high note. I know. <laughs> and it's like, bye, end of webinars. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, no, this is great to at least get to say goodbye. Yeah, no. Thank you so much. Is it any quieter there? Um, it's still raining, but it's not um kind of blowing sideways anymore. Um okay. Right when we were getting started, my brother called me. He's like, you have to get in shelter. And I'm like, I'm supposed to be giving a lecture. So I put my mom in the middle room. That's There's no windows. And oh, my God. I was so worried that you couldn't hear me through the whole thing. So I was like, well. <laughs> no, there were just, a, there was, at the very beginning, there was a moment where we lost a word or two, but it evened out after that. I was I was okay. very worried that was happening. Um, the the first year I was Asley co-president, we were doing so much virtual. Oh, yeah. We had three tornado warnings here. I lost power for two days. <laughs> it was just, I felt like this is ridiculous. I'm texting Amy and Bethany. I'm like, I'm connecting from a hot spot. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, we, we rescued baby ducks that someone I think had gotten for Easter and let out at the lake. And we, my children brought them back. We put them in a cat carrier until we could take them to a rescue. And the tornado sirens are blaring. We're in the hallway. And my kids are like, are the ducks okay? I was like, they're in the laundry room. <laughs> they're in a <laughs> cat crate. <laughs> they will be the only things left standing if this thing blows through here. It's so right. just nerve wracking. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for doing it tonight. Um, I don't want to project on you my own vivid memories of the difficulty, <laughs> but I appreciate your um, I just your cool your coolness and um, sharing such wonderful um, stories with us and and histories as well. My pleasure. No, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank It'll you. It'll be a good story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I so appreciate it, and I will send you um, the paperwork for our business office you can just send it back to me and I'll walk it sure. um, over for signatures and get it sent your way but I'm um, thrilled thrilled for you to have done this tonight and I'm um, wishing you and yours good rest may it blow through and be peaceful soon okay all right well thanks so much Laura great to see you thank you Martin right. for your thank you help. thank Take you care. great thank you thank you Martin oh yeah sure thank you Laura <laughs> have a good night you too bye, bye.